Man, this is a video that I've wanted to make for a long time, and it's very personal to me. It was actually the main reason why I wanted to make this second channel, to share this story. Most of you know me as Movie Flame Online. I've been running that channel for almost six years now, and this is going to be the story of what was going on behind the scenes while I was making those videos for you guys. Recently, we've seen many celebrities start talking about their drug and alcohol abuse. Tom Felton, aka Draco Malfoy, just wrote a book on his experience. And Daniel Radcliffe, of course, came out a while back and said he struggled with substance abuse while filming The Half-Blood Prince. So I figured I would jump on the bandwagon and do my own tell-all. Honestly, this video was for me as much as it is for anybody else. But when I shared small glimpses of my substance abuse on Instagram, I had multiple people reach out, both fans and people that I know in real life, saying that I inspired them to get sober. So my hope is that this video does the same for anybody else out there struggling. I guess we should start with my mental health, because that's as much a part of this story as alcohol and drugs are. A little over 10 years ago, I was diagnosed with psychosis, and they suspected I was bipolar, which turned out to be true when my mind fully developed. I'm now fully diagnosed as being bipolar as well. Growing up, I was the athlete. That's what I was known for. I played three sports, which obviously took a toll on my body, which was already injury prone just due to genetics. So I got hurt a lot, which is actually what led me to discover my love for making videos. While I was injured and couldn't play sports, I taught myself how to film, edit, and make videos in general. Well, that's the upside of these injuries. For this video, we're going to look at the downside of them. With so many injuries, with me being a competitor, I would often play through. I was prescribed a lot of painkillers. I played sports throughout my whole life, but from 7th grade to 12th grade, I took too many painkillers to count, and slowly, it got me very hooked. This was especially true at the end of high school. I loved how these painkillers made me feel. It was a feeling unlike any other that made me escape the world. I did not have any injuries in my senior year of high school, but I was diagnosed with migraine headaches a few years back, so I took full advantage of that. My mom got migraines as well, so I would use that vulnerability and I would manipulate her, telling her that my head hurt and that I needed painkillers for this migraine. Because she got them too, she felt my pain and she would give in and give it to me. This is where the addict in me was really born. As you'll see throughout this video, drug addicts and alcoholics are master manipulators and liars. We will do whatever it takes to get the drugs that we want, even if it means lying and taking advantage of those that we love. For me, on top of the painkillers came alcohol as well. It too was my escape from the world and it made me feel so good. When college rolled around, I was on my own for the first time and I pretty quickly found all the drug dealers at my school, including a few that sold Percocet. I spent all my money on drugs and alcohol, and every time I made those purchases, I thought it was money well spent. During college, I soon realized that I could outdrink everybody, and not only that, I would wake up the next morning and wouldn't be hungover, while all of my friends were basically dead after the night we had. Going over some specific events for this story, it wasn't out of the norm to see me wandering through the halls drunk and high in the middle of the day. And I would go to people's rooms, knock on their doors, they'd open it up and be like, Hey, Drunk Morgan, we love Drunk Morgan. And I ate that shit up. I loved it. It made me want to drink more, it made me want to get high more. I felt as though when I was drunk and high, I was a better version of myself. One night, I knew my parents were coming to visit the next morning, so I told myself I wasn't going to drink that much on Saturday night. That did not go as planned though. After I had one drink, I literally had no willpower whatsoever to stop myself, and I had more and more and more. Early on, it was a scary thought that I couldn't control myself, but I pushed those fears down. I would have a similar experience about a week later. I had a test on Monday, and I knew I needed to study all day Sunday, so I decided to limit myself that Saturday night. But once again, I had no willpower. I couldn't stop myself from drinking more and more and more. I yet again blacked out, and I had these thoughts like, I have a problem. But again, I pushed them down and ignored them. I convinced myself that it was college, and you were supposed to drink every Saturday. It's normal. Eventually, during my first semester of college, I went home for fall break, and I told my sister about all my pill popping, and I did not get the reaction I expected. She slapped me in the face and told me to cut that shit out immediately. I was in shock seeing how serious she was, and I told her I would stop, but I knew I wouldn't. Three days later, I returned to school, and one of my friends saw how high I was upon arrival, so he searched my bag, found my Percocet, and he flushed them down the toilet. I was absolutely furious, and with both of these incidents, I said fuck everybody. 
At that point, I decided to just keep my pill popping a secret. Nobody got mad at me when I drank, so I would just do that publicly and would take pills before and after. I didn't know it at the time, but I quickly took on habits of a serious drug addict and alcoholic. There were many signs, like the secret keeping, the fact that I couldn't stop at just one drink and had to keep going, and the fact that I didn't get hangovers. All signs of a classic alcoholic and drug addict. Now if you don't know, alcoholism is not something that you develop. It's something that you're born with, normally due to genetics. My grandmother and my grandfather on my mom's side were both alcoholics, and my grandfather was hooked on, you guessed it, painkillers for most of his life. To help you understand this, the difference between me back then and a normal college student is that my friends could have one drink and stop, but if I have one drink, I'm fucked. I will keep drinking until I drink myself to sleep. Throughout college, this was a constant cycle. Pop pills before we all drink, go party with my friends, make a fool of myself, and fall asleep wasted. This is of course considered normal in college, so no one really raised an eyebrow at my behaviors. But looking back at pictures and videos from this time, there were actually some really concerning videos of me when I was way too intoxicated, like just being slumped over, pretty much unconscious, me getting mad for no reason, like in this video where I'm yelling at a wall, or this one where I'm fighting a blanket. Getting drunk and high made my mental health come out terribly, which brought forth anger, hallucinations, and I exhibited signs of someone destined to be plagued with substance abuse. Over the next few years, I was known as the party guy, the guy that got wasted and did funny things, the guy that would kill it on the dance floor and would outdrink everyone with a crowd cheering him on. I was normally the life of the party and I loved it. However, when everybody went to bed and I was all alone, I developed another trait that most alcoholics have. As soon as I was alone, I would go from this party animal to a crying mess curled on the floor. I would cry myself to sleep every single time I drank and did drugs. And it wasn't until I got sober years later that I found out most alcoholics go through this exact same thing. During this time in college, I dated two different girls, one during my sophomore year and one during my junior year. Both tried their hardest to stop me from drinking and both eventually caught on to my drug use. It was pretty obvious because they would literally find my pills or I would be sitting there literally shaking because of withdrawal. Looking back, I know they were trying to help me. But they got me so angry when they went to my friends and told them about my substance abuse. But again, my fucked up mind lied to my friends, swept all of it under the rug, manipulated, lied to them, and convinced them it wasn't a problem. All of this only made me hide my pill popping even more than before. To get my past girlfriends to leave me alone, I lied to them and said I would stop taking pills, and they believed me. One of the most fucked up things I did, which again shows my fucked up alcoholic mind, I told her I was going off to rehab, and I didn't text or call her for like 5 days, telling her that they took my phone, when really I was chilling at home drinking and doing more drugs. Looking back, I am so disgusted by my behavior, but that's just it. That's the mind of an alcoholic. During my junior year, my other girlfriend made me promise not to drink that night because I was coming back to hang out with her afterwards, and I fully believed that I could do that. I said I will not drink, but of course... I gave in and had one drink, which led to two, three, four, and eventually like 15. The amount I was drinking was ridiculous. I would drink whole handles by myself in a weekend. I barely added mixer to my mixed drinks that were really just straight alcohol. And my go-to was drinking a whole bottle of Fireball by myself, not to mention the pills I was popping behind everybody's back. My junior year girlfriend eventually found out how many painkillers I was taking after I told her I had stopped. And I just remember the look on her face of straight disappointment and she left the room, went to the bathroom and cried. At that point I was like, okay, I need to make a change. So I tried my hardest not to pop pills for a while and I was pretty successful. Granted, I turned to alcohol more than ever, but I was off Percocet. Not long after that though, my injuries came back as I annihilated my shoulder during a game and I very clearly needed surgery, which of course got me hooked on perks again. After that, it was a wrap. I was more hooked than ever, and I knew that there was a problem, but I didn't care. Again, I just pushed that feeling down. I was working retail that following summer, and I would literally show up high as hell to work every day, and I didn't see a problem with it. At that point while awake, it was more common for me to be high than it was for me not to be high. But eventually, I ran out of pills. So I did what any sane person would do and I pulled my injured shoulder out of my socket, the same one I had just gotten surgery on, just so that I could go to the ER and get more Percocet. 
my insane mind did this three different times that shows you how desperate i was to get my fix i would go to the hospital they'd put it back in place and i'd get my painkillers and be on my way the worst part about this though was that i lied to my family because they were the ones that had to take me to the hospital i obviously couldn't drive because i just pulled my fucking arm out of my socket but after a while i realized i could just make my arm look limp and make it look like I actually pulled my shoulder out, but I really didn't. Again, more and more lies stacked on top of one another, all for my fix. Throughout that summer, I went to the hospital six different times just to get Percocet. I still remember the doctors being like, dude, your arm isn't even out of place. And I would somehow convince them and manipulate them that it must have gone in on its own, but I still was in a lot of pain and needed painkillers, and they would give it to me. This again shows how good at lying and manipulating addicts are. I then started my senior year of college, and my addiction was terrible. My YouTube channel Movie Flame had taken off that summer, meaning I was getting paid a hefty amount, so for the first time, I had all the money in the world to spend on alcohol and painkillers. Around that time, I also met Kara, and we instantly headed off and started dating. But just like with everybody else, I hid my pill popping from her, scared that she would force me to stop or would out me, meaning I wouldn't get my fix. That's the last thing you should be thinking about when you enter a new relationship, but that's the mind of an alcoholic and drug addict, something I really want to make clear in this video. The mind of an alcoholic and drug addict is one of the most interesting and scary things in the world. I had learned from my previous relationships how best to hide my pill popping, and I was incredibly successful this time around. Kara had no idea. I would do things like put the perks in my weekly pill boxes with the medicine I took for mental health, which she of course would never question. However, at this point, taking drugs and alcohol was no longer fun. And I get a little bit emotional talking about this part because it was a really, really hard time. I was pretty much just running from the withdrawal that was awful. I would shake violently and uncontrollably to the point where I got the worst headaches, I got chills, and I felt as though I had to throw up, but I couldn't throw up. It was literally the worst feeling in the world. I want to explain that because I'm trying to explain why I went back to the drugs and alcohol because people can just be like why didn't you just stop because it's not that easy going through that withdrawal almost broke me every single time I felt it <sighs> being with Kara most nights I stopped drinking at nights and would just pop pills she almost called me several times but I would again just come up with an excuse and she would somehow believe me because I was so good at manipulating people. The following semester, Kara studied abroad in Rome. And this is where my addiction got really, really bad. A normal day went like this, I wrote it down. I would wake up, cut a perk 30 in half, take the first half, fill a Starbucks cup with alcohol, go to class with a cup and pretend I was drinking coffee. Then I would get lunch with my friends, but would always leave early because I started to get withdrawal symptoms and needed the other half of the perk. I'd go back to my room, take the other half, fill up my coffee cup with more alcohol, go to my next class. Then after that, I'd go home, take a nap, wake up, pop another perk 30, knock on my friend's door with alcohol in my bag, convince them to drink with me at like 4 p.m., would get even more trashed and go to dinner, would then go back to the dorms, drink until like midnight with my friends, would say goodbye to my friends, then keep drinking in my room until I drank myself into a depression and eventually would drink myself to sleep. It was a terrible way to live, but it was what I had to keep doing to run from the withdrawal, the thing I was so scared of. Then on the weekends, I would wake up and immediately pop a pill and start drinking, and then I would work on movie flame videos, convincing myself that the drugs and alcohol were my inspiration, which of course was not true. This cycle continued until one night when I went too far with mixing drugs and alcohol, and in my sleep I had a seizure. My friends saw the whole thing and it terrified them. Every doctor I've talked to since then said that I should have died right then and there and I was lucky to be alive. While I was lucky to be alive, the seizure did immense damage. I got permanent nerve damage from my shoulders down to my hands. Previously, I could bench press 200 pounds easily, but post nerve damage even today, all these years later, I struggle with 20 pound weights. If I reach out in a weird way, I get terrible shocks all down my arm. And even something as basic as sneezing can make me fall to the ground in pain. Over the years, I've gone to physical therapy, I've gone to too many doctors to count, and all of the doctors said the same thing. It's permanent and there's nothing that can be done. I have to live with the consequences of my actions. But the scariest thing about this 
is I knew this seizure was serious when it happened. But do you want to know what the first thing I did when I woke up the following morning was? I woke up, popped a perk, and started drinking at 10 a.m. I didn't care about what happened to me physically, mentally. I didn't give a shit. All I wanted was my fix. I was broken. I was so broken. It really shows you how far gone I was. <sighs> Moving forward, I blacked out every night, drank myself to sleep, and I continued this dreadful cycle. One night when I blacked out, I told Kara that I thought I had a problem over the phone. But when she brought it up to me the next morning, I denied saying it, got mad at her, and told her I was fine, completely gaslighting her. I finished the semester out, somehow getting A's in all my film classes, but getting C's and D's and everything else. But all I cared about was that I didn't fail. When I went home for the summer, I continued down this awful path. A few weeks after coming home, Kara and I went to Florida where I was filming my face reveal for Movie Flame. I can't even watch that vlog without cringing because I can just see how freaking high I was. I was popping two perks every morning, which for reference is three times what I was taking in the morning while at school. We got all the footage that we needed, had a good time, and the trip took us to Miami to see my older brother. And that is where I hit rock bottom. We went out to a club after we had been drinking all day, and though nobody knew it, I was popping more pills than ever before on top of all of the drinks. While in the club, I realized I was out of perks, so I started asking random people if they had any painkillers. Someone eventually said yes, and without hesitation, I gave them I don't even know how much money, and I immediately popped the pill without even thinking about it. And it was not Percocet. I don't know what it was, but it sent me into a downward spiral. Because of the drug, my psychosis started acting up. I didn't know where I was, didn't know what I was doing, and I didn't know what was real or not. My anger flared up and I left the club. And I was so paranoid that when a guy bumped into me, I grabbed him and flipped him to the ground. I must have looked insane standing over him with rage and confusion on my face. And the hardest part about it was that I can still picture the terrified look on his face. I, I put that look on his face. He was that scared of me. Kara then found me and screamed my name, and in the second that I turned around, the guy got up and ran for what he probably thought was his life. This breaks my heart that I did that to someone. A lot of that night is a blur, but I remember thinking for the first time that these drugs and alcohol weren't my escape, my happy place. They were my prison. I felt awful being intoxicated, and I never wanted to feel that again. I ended up just knocking out and slept for about 15 hours in a car ride while Kara drove us to Myrtle Beach, our next destination on the trip. And you can see from this picture just how fucking gone I was. Slowly, whatever I took in that club wore off, and then I had to face the monster I had been running from for so many years, the withdrawal. Before the withdrawal really kicked in, I admitted everything to Kara. How I had been popping pills in secret for years, that I had a serious problem, and most of all, that I wanted to change. We stayed at Kara's aunt's house in Myrtle Beach, which was this beautiful home right on the water and the golf course, which wasn't a bad place to detox, but the detox was awful. I pushed through it, trying not to let Kara or Kara's aunt even know that anything was happening. Eventually, though, the withdrawal was literally seconds from destroying me. All I wanted was a drink or to pop a pill, and I was very close to doing so. At that very moment though, Kara was looking for me. She called my name and I turned around, left very quickly, and we went on their boat. That boat ride was life-changing for me. Well, it was just a simple boat ride for everybody else there. The wind on my face took the pain of the withdrawal away. And it was this, I got this sense that I, I could do this. I could beat the withdrawal. That little break from the pain was all I needed. One thing about me is that I'm resilient. That is one thing about me that I'm very proud of. I will fight till my last breath. And that's why I was playing sports through injuries that fucked me up in the first place. But finally, I was going to put use to that in a good way. After about 24 hours of being sober, I took the next step and I told my family. My family was amazing and they went into panic mode and got me the help that I needed. When I got home, I said I didn't want to go into an inpatient rehab. The typical thing for that is you spend 28 days there with no electronics, no phone, no computer. But I really wanted to do Movie Flame. I wanted to make videos for you guys. As crazy as it seems, I was like in an, an insane amount of pain. And I knew 
going to an inpatient rehab probably would have made it easier, but I said, no, fuck it. I want to make videos. I don't want to let all of these viewers down. So instead, I went to an IOP or an intensive outpatient program, which basically you go to um, during the day, but at, you still live at home. And I went four times a week. On top of that, I went to AA meetings and I made a whole group of sober friends. My sober friends were pretty much the only people besides Kara and my family that I saw because I just couldn't be around any alcohol or anything that reminded me of my crazy college days. Both my new sober friends and my college friends were incredibly supportive though. But most of all, Kara was the one that made the biggest difference. Part of my treatment at the IOP was actually preparing me for Kara leaving me. And my family did the same. Everybody was convinced that she would break up with me. But Kara stuck with me despite the fact that we had only been together for about 9 months and we're still together today and we're getting married in a few short months, which is crazy. Even with Kara though, staying sober those first few months were the hardest thing I've ever had to do and I had some really close calls. Being so focused on not drinking and not taking drugs, my mental health was pretty shot. I had struggled with mental health for a long time and this might have been where it was at its worst. My anger was horrible, I had some terrible panic attacks, and my bipolar really acted out and I got manic a bunch of times, which is honestly the worst thing that can happen because I'm a different person when I'm manic with literally no conscience, which is terrifying. Over that next year, I struggled immensely. I turned to food because it was something to replace the drugs and alcohol, and I got pretty freaking fat. One thing that helped so much though was getting my dog Loki, who was just a natural therapy dog even without being trained. If I was struggling, he would sense it, come over and cuddle me, and I would instantly calm down. I eventually moved in with Kara after a year of sobriety, and I stopped going to my IOP. Now this is where everybody expects your sobriety story to end. You finished your treatment at the IOP, everything's good, you're still sober, you seem like you're doing well. But the truth is, I was not. I was not doing well. That next year was a struggle as well, and I got even fatter as I relied on food more than ever. When I hit two years of sobriety, everybody was so proud of me, but I was struggling more than ever. I didn't dare tell anybody though because all of my loved ones were so proud of me and I didn't want to let them down. So I suffered silently, thinking about nothing but drugs and alcohol. It was the last thing I thought about when I went to bed, and it was the first thing I thought about when I woke up. On top of that, I lost a few friends that I had gotten sober with, which was a gut punch, and honestly sent me into a bit of a depression. On top of that, I compared my sobriety to one of my other friends who I got sober with. We were literally just a few weeks off on our sober date. He was happy, he was living his life, and I was like, why, why isn't this happening for me? When coming up on three years sober, I mastered almost everything in life except for my cravings. I bought a house, I lost 55 pounds and was in great shape, though still very weak because of the nerve damage. I had to turn to cardio instead of lifting, which was an adjustment, but it was a challenge that replaced binge eating, and that was all that mattered. I then mastered my mental health as I got really into meditation, and when I say mastered, I mean I learned how to maintain it. You never really master your mental health completely, it's a constant struggle. I also matured a bunch as a person around this time, and my relationships in my life were all great. However, even with all of that, I still had a lot of cravings. Instead of getting better, it was actually getting worse. I was having more and more thoughts of alcohol and drugs, and man, I was tired. I was so fucking tired of fighting. I had been fighting for almost four years at this point, fighting cravings, fighting withdrawal, and I was, I was just done. That is when I went to an AA meeting for the first time in years, and I did it with my friend who I had been comparing myself to. He told me his secret, do the 12 steps of AA. At this point, I was like, screw it, I'll try anything, I'm, I'm like dead inside. So I started doing the 12 steps, I got a sponsor. And I don't want to talk too much about like the AA process because you're not supposed to monetize it, but yeah. Doing the 12 steps changed my life. It's gotten me to a point where almost a year later since going to that meeting and starting the steps, I'm glad I'm an alcoholic, which is something I never thought I would say. And it might sound crazy, but the reason I say that is because doing these 12 steps not only kept me sober, but it made me a better person. It makes you reflect on your whole life your relationships in life, 
what you're doing with your life, how you think, how you act, all of it. And AA is just a blessing. While doing the 12 steps, I actually got this bracelet that means so much to me. It says, one day at a time. And it has my sobriety date, 6-10-2018. I'm not ashamed of my addiction. I'm actually incredibly proud of it because it led to what I think is the greatest achievement I've ever had in my life. My fight is not over though. I have to fight it every single day, but I have equipped myself with my mind, the people around me, and the steps that I take to face that battle every single day and win. Today, I'm a month away from being sober for half a decade. I've completed the 12 steps of AA and can now help others through the steps as well. I no longer have any cravings. I'm in great shape exercising almost every day. I'm getting married to the girl everyone thought would leave me, but that stayed and turned out to be my biggest supporter. And for the first time in a very long time, I'm happy. My story is filled with trauma and obstacles, but in the end, it made me the person I am today. And that person is somebody that I am so proud to be. That was hard. That was the hardest thing I've ever had to record. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Um, if you enjoyed this content, please subscribe. Hit the like button to help with the algorithm. And please share these videos. I would love for more people to see this. Maybe get inspired from it. But yeah, I appreciate everybody that made it this far in the video. And thank you so much for watching.